Currently, I serve as the chief architect for a company called Internobus. The peculiar thing about Internobus is that we've been doing domain-driven design since the day the company was founded. And I was invited here to share with you our DDD journey. In the first part of this presentation, I will walk you through the various systems from our business domain and how we have implemented them. And of course, I won't be able to cover everything, so I will concentrate on five bounded contexts that demonstrate the different approaches to DDD that we've tried and the results that we achieved. In the second part, I will use those five bounded contexts to share some practical advice on DDD, event sourcing, CQRS, and a bit about microservices. So let's get started. About seven years ago, I got a phone call from a friend. He said that he was starting a new company. The business was not going to be simple, but if I joined him, technically, I could do whatever I wanted. And since back then I had a pretty boring job, I agreed just like that. Let me show you what I've got myself into. Let's say you're producing a product or a service. Internovus allows you to outsource all your marketing-related chores. We'll come up with the best marketing strategy for your product. Our copywriters and graphic designers will produce tons of creative materials, such as banners and landing pages, to run advertising campaigns to promote your product. All the leads generated by these campaigns are going to be handled by our sales agents, who will make the calls and sell your products. Of course, this whole process provides many opportunities for optimization, and that's exactly what our analysis department is going to do. They're going to analyze all the data to make sure that you are getting the biggest bang for a buck, be it by pinpointing the most successful campaigns, most effective creatives, or by making sure that agents are, wor are working on the most promising leads. That's the system that I signed up to, signed up to build. And since we were a self-funded company, we had to get rolling as fast as possible. So we started by implementing the uh, first third of our value chain. We had to provide a way for media buyers to manage contracts with various publishers, a catalog for our designers to manage their creatives, and of course, a campaign management solution to run advertising campaigns, which meant not only a management system, but also an advertisement serving solution as well. Now, I don't know about you, but all these business domains initially sounded terribly complex to me. But fortunately for me, no, not long before we started working, I read a book with the words complexity in software in its title. Maybe you've heard about it. It wasn't an easy book to read, but luckily for me, I felt that I've got a really strong grasp of domain-driven design by reading only the first four chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Guess how the system was initially designed? Its architectural style could be neatly summarized as aggregates everywhere. Campaigns, placements, funnels, creatives, each and every noun in the requirements was proclaimed as an aggregate. And all those aggregates resided in a huge lone bonded context. Yeah, exactly the same monolith that everyone warns you about nowadays. And of course, those were no aggregates at all. That was just an anemic domain model. They didn't provide any transactional boundaries and they had very little behavior in them. All the behavior resided here, in a big, fat service layer. Frankly, this was no work of art, right? It's like by the book example of what domain driven design is not, how it shouldn't be done. But it looked quite different from the business perspective. From their standpoint, it was considered a huge success. Despite the imperfect architecture, despite our very unique approach to QA, We delivered working software in a very aggressive time to market. How did we do it? And the answer is simple, ubiquitous language. We somehow managed to come up with a robust ubiquitous language. None of us had any prior experience in marketing domain, but we could still hold a conversation 
with domain experts. We understood them, they understood us. And to our astonishment, domain experts turned out to be very nice people. <laughs> they really enjoyed and appreciated the fact that we were willing to learn from them and their experience. This smooth communication allowed us to grasp the business domain really quickly and implement it in code. Yeah, it was a very big, scary monolith. But for two developers in a garage, I guess it was just good enough. Again, we delivered a working software in a very aggressive time to market. And this diagram kind of sums up our understanding of domain-driven design at this point. Ubiquitous language and an anemic domain model in a monolithic bounded context. As time passed, leads started flowing in and we were in a rush. Sales agents needed a robust CRM system to work with. CRM is customer relations management. The CRM had to aggregate all incoming leads. It had to group them based on their target markets, languages, countries, and other parameters. Distribute the leads across multiple desks around the globe and integrate with our client systems, both to complement our leads with additional information and to notify our clients about changes in the leads life cycles. And of course, the CRM had to provide as many optimization opportunities as possible. For example, ability to make sure that agents are working on the most promising leads, to assign leads to agents based on their qualifications and past performance, and to allow a very flexible solution for calculating agents' commissions. Since all these requirements didn't quite fit any existing off-the-shelf product, we decided to roll out our own. Our initial implementation approach was the good old DDD, or DDD Lite. We said, again, we'll call every noun in the requirements and aggregate and shoehorn them into this huge monolithic bounded context. This time, however, something felt wrong right from the start. We noticed that all too often we were adding awkward prefixes to aggregates names like CRM lead and marketing lead, marketing campaign and CRM campaign. And interestingly, we never used those prefixes in conversations with domain experts. They somehow always understood the meaning from the context. And then I recalled that there was a chapter with something about context in the big blue book. So I went back and this time I read the book chapter to chapter. <laughs> uh, cover to cover, sorry. <laughs> I learned that bounded context, <laughs> gamers around here. I, <laughs> I learned that bounded context solves exactly the issue that we have faced. They protect consistency of the language. Also, I've read Von Vernon's book, which came out. And finally, I understood that aggregates aren't just data structures, by, but they play a much more important role by protecting consistency of the data. So we took a few steps back and re redesigned our CRM solutions to reflect those revelations. First of all, we divided our monolith into two distinct bounded contexts, marketing and CRM. We didn't go crazy with microservices or anything here. We just did the bare minimum to protect our ubiquitous language. But in this bounded context, the new one, we said we are not going to repeat the same mistakes we already did in the marketing. This time, no more anemic domain models. This time, only real domain model with real by the book aggregates. In particular, each transaction will affect only one instance of an aggregate. Instead of an ORM, the aggregate itself will manage its boundaries. The service layer will go on a very strict diet and all the business logic will be moved to its corresponding aggregates. We thought that these aggregates will definitely make Eric and Van proud of us. We were so enthusiastic about doing things the right way but very soon, soon it became apparent that modeling a proper domain model is really damn hard. <laughs> Relative to marketing context, everything took much more time. It was almost impossible to get the transactional boundaries right the first time. We had to evaluate at least a few models 
only to discover that the one we never thought about was the correct one. The price of doing things the right way was very high for us. Time, lots of time. And sooner than later, it became obvious. There is no way we're gonna meet the deadlines. So our management decided to help us. They offloaded implementation of some of the requirements to DBAs. Yeah, store procedures. So much damage along the line. Not because SQL is, let's say, not the best language for describing business logic. The real issue was a bit more subtle. This situation produced an implicit bounded context with a boundary dissecting one of our most complex business entities, the lead. The result was two teams working on the same business component, implementing closely related features with minimal interaction between them. And of course, there was no ubiquitous language. Literally, each team had its own vocabulary to describe the business domain and rules. The Conway's law just kicked our asses. <laughs> the models were inconsistent. There was no shared understanding. Knowledge was duplicated in both contexts. And rest assured, once the business logic had to change, the implementations went out of sync just like that. Nightmare. Needless to say, the project wasn't delivered anywhere near its time and was full of bugs. Not just small bugs, but nasty production issues that had flown under the radar for years, corrupting our most precious asset, our data. The only solution for fixing this mess was to completely throw away the old implementation and rewrite the lead aggregate from scratch in a proper boundaries, which we did a couple of years, a couple, a couple of years later. It wasn't easy, but the mess was so bad, like there was no other way around it. So to sum it up, at this stage, our understanding of domain-driven design looked like this. Ubiquitous language protected by bounded contexts, and instead of an anemic domain model everywhere, a real domain model everywhere. Of course, a crucial part of DDD is missing here. And I'm talking about subdomains, their types, and their effect on implementation strategies. Initially, we wanted to do the best job possible, but ended up wasting lots of time and effort by building domain models for supporting subdomains. As Eric Evans put it, not all of a large system will be well, well designed. We learned it the hard way and wanted to use the core knowledge in our next project, Event Crunchers. After the CRM was rolled out, we've noticed that there was an implicit domain hiding across marketing and CRM. Whenever the process of handling incoming customer events was modified, we had to introduce changes both in marketing and CRM. And since conceptually this process didn't belong to any of them, we decided to extract it into its own bounded context, event crunchers. Now, since we didn't make any money out of the way we move data around, and we couldn't buy an existing solution, it sounded pretty much like a vanilla supporting subdomain. So we've decided as such. Nothing fancy this time, just simple ETA-like transaction scripts. And this solution actually worked well for a while. <laughs> as our business evolved, more and more features were implemented here. BI people asked us for, to put a flag to mark new customers, <laughs> another flag to mark new leads, etc., etc., and eventually those simple flags evolved into fully fledged business logic with complex rules and invariants. And guess what happens when you implement complex business logic as transaction scripts? This happens. Yeah. <laughs> What started out as simple transaction scripts grew up to be a fully fledged core business domain. And since we didn't adapt our implementation strategy, we ended up with a very big ball of mud. Each modification to this code base became more and more expensive. Quality went downhill and we were forced to rethink our implementation. And we did it 
about a year later. The business logic grew so complex that it could only be tackled by event sourcing. So we refactored this code base into an event source domain model with other bounded context subscribing to its events. And we also had a very similar experience to this in, our, in another project. One day, sales desk managers had asked us to implement a simple yet tedious procedure that they've been doing manually, calculating commissions for sales agents. Again, it, sound, it sounded pretty simple. Once a month, just calculate a percentage of each agent's sales and send the payments reports to the managers. As before, we contemplated whether or not this is our core domain. We didn't in invent something new there. We didn't make money out of this process. We couldn't buy an existing solution. So again, it sounded like a typical supporting subdomain. Therefore, we didn't go crazy over, it, over its design. Active record objects orchestrated by, by a service layer. <coughs> Once this process became automated, boy, did everyone become creative about it. Our analysts wanted to optimize the heck out of it. They wanted to try different percentages. They wanted to make the percentages functions of some measurements and upgrade the percentages if some conditions were met, etc., etc. Guess when this implementation has broke down? <laughs> and it did break down. Again, the code base became a ball of mud. Adding new features turned to be very expensive. Bugs started to appear. And when you're dealing directly with money, even the smallest bug can have very serious outcomes. Ask me how I know. As with crunchers, at some point, we couldn't bear it anymore. We had to completely throw away the old implementation and rewrite it from ground up, this time as an event source domain model. Now, let's see what happened here. Just as in the event crunchers, the business domain was initially categorized as a supporting one. But as the system evolved, it gradually mutated into a core domain. We found ways of making money out of these processes. However, there is a striking difference between these two bounded contexts. For the bonuses, we had a ubiquitous language. And even though the initial implementation was based on active records, we could still have a ubiquitous language. You know, CRUD is not a bad word if your domain experts are using it. But as the complexity grew, the language got more and more complicated as well. It could no longer be modeled as active records. And this allowed us to notice the need for a change in the implementation strategy much earlier than in crunchers. We saved a lot of time and effort by not trying to fit a square peg in a round hole thanks to the ubiquitous language. So that's what our vision of DDD looked like at this point. Pretty much a classic one. We have ubiquitous language, bounded context, domain types, and implementation according to the type. And the fifth and the last bounded context I want to talk about is Marketing Hub. Our management was looking for a profitable new vertical. They pondered why couldn't we use our ability to generate massive amounts of leads and sell them to small co smaller clients, small companies that we've never worked with before. So we said, let's give it a try. This project was called Marketing Hub. Since, since this domain was defined as new profit opportunity by the management, it was clearly a core business domain. So, so design-wise, we pulled out the heavy artillery here. Event source domain model, CQRS, and back then there was one buzzword started getting lots of traction, microservices. So we decided to give it a try. That's what our solution looked like. Small services, each had its own database, both synchronous and asynchronous communication between them. On paper, we expect it to be a work of art. As always, in practice, not so fast. <laughs> we naively approached microservices, thinking that the smaller the service, the better. We drew service boundaries around the aggregates. In DDD lingo, each aggregate became a bounded context of its own. Again, initially it looked great. It allowed us to implement each service according to its specific needs. Only one would be using event sourcing, 
and the rest will be state-based aggregates. And all of them could be maintained and evolved independently. However, as the system grew, the services became more and more chatty. Almost each of them needed data from all other services to complete some of its operations. What was intended to be a decoupled system ended up being a distributed monolith, an absolute nightmare to maintain. And there was another issue with, we had with this architecture. We had used the most complex patterns for modeling the business logic, event sourcing, and domain model. We carefully crafted all those services, but it all was in vain. Behind this complex architecture stood a very simple business logic. So simple, it could, could have been implemented using active records. Despite the fact <laughs> that it was considered a core domain by the business, it had no technical complexity in it. It turned out the business was looking to make money not by use of clever algorithms, but by leveraging our existing relationships with other companies. And when these complexities differ greatly, it leads to accidental complexity. And that's what this architecture ended up being, accidental complexity. The system was hugely over-engineered. So those are the five bundle contexts I want to tell you about. Marketing, CRM, crunchers, bonuses, and marketing hub. Now let's see what we have learned from this experience. First and foremost, the ubiquitous language. I believe that ubiquitous language is the most important part of domain driven design. It's the core domain of DDD. The ability to speak the same language with domain expert proved to be indispensable for us. It turned out to be a much more effective way of sharing knowledge than documents, tests, and even JIRA. And more than that, the ability to hold a conversation with domain experts for us was a major predictor of project success. Like in our marketing context, when we just started, our implementation was far from perfect. But the robust ubiquitous language compensated for the architectural shortcomings, and we were able to deliver the project's goals. In the CRM context, we screwed it up. Unintentionally, we had two languages describing the same business domain. This led to lots of problems. And even though we strived to have a proper design here, because of the communication issues, we ended up with a huge mess. The event crunches. This project started as a simple supporting subdomain, so we didn't invest in ubiquitous language. When the complexity started growing, we regretted this decision big time. Even though we had to redesign the project, it would have taken us much less time had we initially started with the ubiquitous language, like we did in the bonuses project. The business logic became orders of magnitude more complex, but the ubiquitous language allowed us to notice the need for a change in the implementation strategy much earlier. And speaking of supporting subdomains, it doesn't really matter what kind of business domain you are working on. Our take on it right now is ubiquitous language is not, an, is not an option. It's a requirement even for core supporting and even generic domains. We've also learned to invest in the ubiquitous language early on. From our experience in the CRM context, it is practically impossible to fix a language if it has been spoken for a while in a company. We were able to fix the implementation here. It wasn't easy, but eventually we did it. But that's not the case for the language. To this day, people are still using the languages that were defined in our initial implementation. Also, if you take care of the ubiquitous language early enough, it is very cheap. Many have the impression that it will be expensive to allocate domain expert time for interactions with IT people. Not true in our experience. Domain experts, our domain experts, were sick and tired of software engineers trying to act as if they know how to solve problems in domains they have absolutely no experience in. So that's why they were, were very cooperative and willing to help. 
So in our experience in, in Chernobyl, you don't need a budget for a ubiquitous language. At most, a cup of coffee, that's it. Next, domain types. We all know that according to DDD, there are three types of business domains. Core domains, the stuff that you do differently from your competitors to gain, to gain competitive advantage. Supporting domains, the stuff you do differently, but it doesn't provide any competitive edge. And generic domains, the stuff that everyone is doing the same way. It's a common practice to use this categorization to drive design decisions. With the core domains, use the heavy artillery. Domain models, event sourcing. For supporting domains, you can use some rapid application development framework. And generic domains, in many cases, are cheaper to buy than to implement yourself. However, for us, there was a problem with this model. Companies, and especially startups like, like ours, tend to change and reinvent themselves over time. Businesses evolve, new profit sources are evaluated, others neglected, and sometimes unexpected opportunities are discovered. As a result, the business domain's types change accordingly. And speaking of our company, I think I have experienced almost all possible changes in domain's types. Event crunchers and bonuses, both of them started as supporting domains, but once we discovered ways of making money out of these processes, they became core domains. In the marketing context, we implemented our own creative catalog. Nothing really special or complex about it. However, a few years later, an open source proje project came out and it offered exactly the same functionality and a bit more than we originally had. So we replaced our code with this product. What happened here? A supporting domain became a generic one. In the CRM context, we had a very clever algorithm that evaluated and identified the most promising leads. We refined it over time, tried various implementations, but eventually it was replaced <laughs> with a fully managed machine learning model running on AWS. What was a core domain for us became a generic domain. We've also seen our marketing hub context. What started as a core domain ended up being a supporting domain since the competitive edge resided in a completely different dimension. And we have quite a few examples in our industry of companies that turned generic and supporting subdomains into their core businesses. For example, Amazon and their AWS cloud. Now, once this kind of change happens, your design should evolve accordingly. Failing to do so in time will lead to lots of accidental complexities, like in our case. Hence, instead of making design decisions based on domain types, I prefer to reverse this relationship. For each domain, we design its implementation first. No gold plating here, the simplest design that will do the job. And from this design, we deduce the domain's type. The first benefit of this approach is less waste. Your implementation is driven by the requirements at hand. It's not going to be over-engineered, as it happened for us in the marketing hub context. And it's not going to be under-engineered, as it happened for us in the bonuses context. Second, reversing this relationship creates a dialogue between you and the business. And you see, sometimes business people need you as much as you need them. Because if they think that something is a core business, but you can implement it in a day, then probably some questions should be raised about the business. <laughs> On the other hand, what if a domain is considered as a supporting by the business, but it can only be implemented with a domain model or event sourcing? And here things get interesting. There are two options. First, maybe business people got over creative with the requirements and end up with an accidental business complexity. It happens. In, in such cases, requirements can and probably should be simplified. Second option, much more interesting. It might be that the business can employ this domain to gain an additional competitive edge, as it happened with our bonuses module. In such a case, you are helping the business 
to identify new profit sources much faster. And by the way, designing the implementation strategy first is pretty simple. We found a couple of very simple heuristics to streamline this decision-making process. The, mo the most important question you have to answer here is how should the business logic be modeled in code? And here we have four options, four patterns. Transaction script, active record, domain model. And by domain model, I mean the technical patterns from DDD and event sourcing. You can decide which of these patterns you should use by answering a few simple questions. First, does the domain in question deal with money directly, require deep analytics, or require an audit log by the law? If the answer is yes, use the event source domain model. Second, how complex is the business logic? Is it more complex than some input validations? Does it have complicated business rules and invariants? If it does, use the domain model. Third, if on the other hand the business logic is simple, then how complex are the data structures? If you've got some complicated object trees with relationships between them, go with active record. And finally, if the answers to all those questions were negative, use a simple transaction script. Once you've decided which of these patterns to use, it's pretty much a trivial job to map a suitable architectural pattern. In most cases, event sourcing requires CQRS. Domain model requires hexagonal architecture. Use layered architecture for active record and for transaction script. In many cases, you can even do away without layers. There's one exception here and it's CQRS. I will get, ba get back to it in a minute. Now, let's say you've chosen an implementation strategy, but over time it started breaking under its own weight. For example, you've been using the active record pattern, but mant maintaining and modifying the business logic became painful. This pain is a very important signal. Use it. It means that the domain has evolved, and it very well might be that it's time to go back and rethink its type and implementation strategy. If the type has changed, go and talk with your domain experts to understand the business context. It might be that it's time to redesign the implementation to meet the new business realities. But you shouldn't be afraid of such a change because once, you did, once this decision on how to model the business logic was made consciously and you are aware of, of all possible options, options it becomes much easier to react to such a change and to refactor the implementation to a more elaborate pattern. Now let's talk a bit more in depth about CQRS. Historically, CQRS is closely related to event sourcing. If you're doing event sourcing, in almost all cases, you need CQRS. But it's crucial to understand that those are two conceptually different patterns. Event sourcing is a way of modeling a business domain. CQRS is an architectural pattern. It allows you to represent the same data in different models. <coughs> for example, for event sourcing, you have the event store for writing and projections for reading. Same data in different models. And we found that CQRS can be very beneficial for all kinds of business domains, even for those implemented as simple transaction scripts or active records. In such cases, what, what we did is state-based projections. We projected an, a, a different models out of the state that was persistent, persisted in the right database. And by using CQRS in such cases, we were able to tackle a lot of complexities in our marketing context. It was started originally as a monolith, but eventually we, we refactored it to microservices. I'll get, back to, I'll get back to it in a minute. And we've used CQRS there a lot. And finally, let's talk about bundled contexts. At Internos, we tried quite a few strategies for decomposing a system into bounded contexts. First, we tried linguistic boundaries. We split our initial monolith into marketing and CRM context to protect our ubiquitous language. Next, we tried domain-based boundaries. 
most of our business domains were implemented into in their own bounded contexts, for example, crunchers and bonuses. We also tried dedicating a bounded context for a single aggregate. This approach didn't work in the marketing hub context, but it did work in other scenarios. And finally, I also shown you how we dissected and aggregate into two distinct bounded contexts. This decomposition strategy can be called suicidal boundaries. <laughs> Don't ever try this at home. But seriously, as this paper says, correct boundaries are important for a peaceful coexistence of systems and teams in our case. So after trying out many ways of doing it, I want to show you the strategy for setting the boundaries that you are using right now. As Udi said, finding boundaries is really hard. There is no flowchart for that. And this statement has profound implications. Since there is no flowchart, the only way of finding the right boundaries is by making some trial and error work yourself. Which means, by definition, there will be mistakes. There is no way around it. So let's acknowledge this and only make mistakes that are easy to fix and try to avoid, avoid doing one, the fatal ones. In our experience, it is much cheaper to extract a bounded context of a bigger one than to start with really small microservices and find the complexities later. Therefore, I always prefer to start with bigger contexts and decompose them later on, as more knowledge is acquired about the business. Now, how big should, be, should the initial boundaries be? The heuristic that works best for us is the less you know about the business domains, the wider the initial boundaries are. So for more complex domains, start with bigger boundaries. But for simpler ones like supporting domains, you can start decomposing a bit earlier. When we've tried to decompose the f uh, to find a great bounded context early on, as in the case of marketing, marketing Hub, we ended up with a, with a distributed monolith. On the contrary, the marketing context started up as a monolith, but it was decomposed later on. We extracted campaigns, publishers, creative catalog, events, and again, it's evident even here, the simpler the domain is, the more narrow are its boundaries. Hence, now our policy is start with bigger boundaries and decompose as you gain domain knowledge. So those are the five practical advices I wanted to share. Ubiquitous language is not optional. Domain types change. Embrace those changes. Learn the ins and outs of the four patterns of modeling business logic. Use CQRS to represent the same data in multiple models. And regarding bounded context, start with bigger boundaries and decompose as you gain more domain knowledge. And to sum it all up, I'll quickly, summar quickly summarize our current approach to implementing domain-driven design. We always start with the ubiquitous language. To protect our language, our initial decomposition strategy is linguistic boundaries. For each domain, we decide how it will be implemented by following the simple heuristics that I've shown you. From the design, we deduce the types of the domains and verify them with the business. And finally, as more domain knowledge is acquired, we decompose the bounded context even further into more fine-grained microservices. And if we compare our vision of DDD now to the one we started with, I would say that the main difference is we went from aggregates everywhere to ubiquitous language everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. You can find me on Twitter. Occasionally, I rant on DDD and other topics on my blog. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now or during the break. <laughs> Thank you.